Hello and a warm welcome to today's Select Science webinar entitled Label Free High Throughput Mouldy Toff Mass Spectrometry and Drug Discovery. My name is Emily Adam and I will be standing in as moderator for today's presentation. I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, Matthias Trost, Professor of Proteomics at the University of Newcastle in the UK. This presenter will give you an current overview of label-free, high-throughput, mouldy tough mass spectrometry and its use in drug discovery screening. Matthias will explain the basics of mouldy tough mass spectrometry and the benefits of label-free screening compared to current labelled approaches. Just before I hand you over to today's speaker, I would like to mention a couple of things. Please feel free to ask questions to the Q&A session at any time during the webinar by clicking on a Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. To view the presentation in full screen, click on the tab at the bottom right of the media player window. Finally, an on-demand version of this webinar will be available in a few days' time. So, without further delay, I'm delighted to hand you over to Matthias and want to thank you for presenting to us today. Please go ahead. Well, hello everyone. Thanks very much for joining me today for all my, our talk, Label Free High Throughput Mildly Tough Mass Spectrometry and Duct Discovery. So my lab is a lab that is a mass spectrometry lab, and we're interested in uh, ubiquity relation, drug discovery, and mass spectrometry. And in recent years, we have moved quite a bit in combining these together. As most of you probably know, drug discovery is a process in which we often have a target that we validated out of genetic or cellular or in vivo experimental data. And once we have identified the target, the first step very often is to actually do a high throughput compound screen. And these are often very high throughput screens where we screen up to 2 million compounds um, against these screens. There's also then often secondary screens which then only comprise the hits from the first screen, which is often only a few thousand screens. And only then, once we have validated these further, these are then taken up further into in vivo data analysis on vivo uh, experiments. Now, what are the current problems in high throughput screening? So the key aspects that we are necessary for high throughput screening is that it's a simple and robust assay because we want to screen up more, sometimes more than 2 million compounds. It needs to be a biologically relevant setup because we want to reflect the activity as much as possible um, as in vivo. And it, we usually must have a really good signal-to-noise ratio in these assays because of when you screen that many compounds, you want to have very good statistical significance. Now, the majority of the in vitro assays that are used in high throughput screening are actually often fluorescent readout or colorimetric readout. So we have, for example, FRET assays or absorbance and fluorescence assays where we have, for example, some more interaction between enzyme and substrate. But there are potential problems with this because often we cannot use the physiological substrate for this which, because we're actually measuring uh, or we're measuring actually the, uh, an indirect substrate by secondary assays. And this can lead to false positives or false negatives. And sometimes in some assays that we have seen already in the, is actually that some of the compounds that fluoresce themselves, you can't use in a fluorescent screen. So I'm going to show you today some examples where we can actually use now Malditoff mass spectrometry for high throughput screening of drugs. So to, first, I think, because may, maybe not everyone is an expert in the ubiquitin system, I give a few introductory slides to the ubiquitin system and how Malditoff mass spectrometry uh, works. And then I'll show you data on our uh, published work of high throughput DUP assay. I later go on onto an E3 ligase assay that is just about to be submitted. And then, again, um, I go into um, a published work, which is the Malditoff kinase assay. Now, Ubiquitin. So ubiquitin is a small protein of 76 amino acids, and it's ubiquitous in the eukaryotic system, and this is where it gets its name from. And it's almost identical in all uh, eukaryotes as a, se as a sequence. It can be covalently attached to target lysines, and now actually it seems to be other amino acids as well, through its C-terminus. And because it contains seven lysines and the N-terminus, which can all be ubiquitinated again, we have actually eight different chain types that can be formed. And it's a very important phosphorylation modification across virtually all biology. 
here you can see some of the structures of diubiquitins, and you can and, uh, appreciate that the structures of these ubiquitin chains are very different. And this actually uh, shows you why there is such a different biology. And for example, linear chains, which are important for uh, innate immune signaling, look, of course, very different from, for example, the lysine 48 chains, which lead to proteosomal degradation. And what you can also anticipate is that this becomes even more complicated by the fact that we can have monoubiquitylation on a substrate, multi monoubiquitylation we can have homogeneous chains, we can have mixed chains, and now even branched chains have been shown. And this almost gives you like a, com a complexity, like for example, for glycosylation, and this make, uh, but this now with, with a whole protein, and this makes it really such a quite complicated uh, uh, system. But the ubiquitin system is becoming a very attractive drug target. And one reason is because we have specialized enzymes. So the way it works in the ubiquitin system is that we have in the human genome only two E1 ligases. And the E1 ligase gets charged with ubiquitin by the usage of ATP. It then transfers this uh, ubiquitin onto E2 ligases. And there's only about 35 E2 ligases in the human genome. And then it binds to an E3 ligase, and there's about 600 to 700 E3 ligases in the human genome, which then give the specificity for the substrate. And then the, we transfer the ubiquitin from the E2, or sometimes via the E3, onto a lysine of the substrate. And this process can be done multiple times to form chains on the substrate. This process is, of course, reversible by, um, by so-called deubiquitylases, or dubs, and there's about 100 enzymes um, available in the system. And you can appreciate that we have about 800, 900 proteins in the human genome um, that only take care of the ubiquitin system that, that tells you how important the system is for the human cell. Now, because the E3 ligases and dubs are highly specific to their substrates normally, they represent very good drug targets. And this can be seen by the effect that we have seen that this regulation of the ubiquitin pathway has been shown to be uh, important in cancer, autoimmune diseases, as well as new degenerative diseases. And particularly, the, the uh, development of Velcade, which is a specific proteasome inhibitor, which obviously affects the ubiquitin system, and, and this is a very powerful anti-cancer drug, this has then shown more interest in drug discovery in the ubiqu ubiquitin system. Now, a few years ago, I was asked by a colleague to look into uh, ways of possibly um, getting the DAP assay working and in a high throughput manner. So DAPs, as I told you, are these enzymes that cleave your big chains. And the normal DAP assay works as such that you have in an in vitro system your, your recombinant protein, your recombinant DAP, and then you put a diubiquitin in there. And if your DAP cleaves it, you form out of your diubiquitin to monoubiquitin. Now, the normal way this was done by the time is actually that you use um, um, SDS gels and you run your DAP with eight different diubiquitins, and then you can see in this gel uh, how they, they, some of them are actually cleaving specifically um, certain chains. But you can probably see that this is not very high throughput and not something you can really do for drug discovery. So, so there is actually in the ubiquitin, for the ubiquitin for DAPs, there is actually a high throughput screening um, available, but this works on ubiquitin rhodamine 110. So this is a ubiquitin that is uh, labeled with a rhodamine fluorophore at the C-terminus. This is not even a peptide bond, but then some DAPs can actually cleave off this rhodamine, and you can measure this. However, I guess as you can uh, appreciate here, um, this this it is missing the second ubiquitin, and some dubs actually need to, to, to bind to both the first and the second ubiquitin to make a proper cleavage. And this is, of course, not a physiological substrate, the ubiquitin rhodamine 110, and therefore we can have problems there. So our idea was now to actually use this high throughput capability of the rhodamine assay, but we want to use physiological substrate and the linkage specificity that we can have by using diubiquitins and physiological substrates, and we want to combine the two into a new assay where we ideally use as little material as possible. Now, so we came up with the Malditov DAP assay, and the way it works is that we put in vitro um, our DAP together with a diubiquitin, um, which then cleaves the diubiquitin, and we stop the reaction um, after about 30 minutes, and we stop it with trifluoric acid. 
And then um, actually we have monoubiquitin formation and we add N15 labeled ubiquitin as an internal standard. So our assay now looks like that we have our N15 um, labeled ubiquitin as an internal standard and we have this increase of intensity that we get with time. And as you can see in the mass spectrometer, we're using just the, the, the mass area around our both ubiquitins that we can now use the mass spectrometer intensity as a readout. And because we use this internal standard, this is very good to normalize and quantify, and this gives very high data robustness, as we have shown actually in this paper that we published 2014 in Nature Communications. Here you see actually a real spectrum, where you see on the right-hand side the N15 labeled ubiquitin, and on the left-hand side you see the monoubiquitin. What you can also see is that we actually require a high resolution on this mass spectrometer because the diubiquitin, the doubly charged ion of the diubiquitin on the far left, is only nine Daltons away from the monoubiquitin, and therefore we need to resolve these, um, these ions really well, and this is what, why we need a really good mass spectrometer for that. Now, in MALDI, and I think many of you might not know this, how, how does MALDI work? So MALDI stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization. And the way it works is that you take your sample and you mix it with a matrix, which is usually an organic acid um, that is uh, aromatic, and then you have about 10,000 molar axis of your matrix. You put it onto a target, and these are usually metal targets. Here we, we see on the left-hand side a 1536 target, and you spot something around 200 to 500 nanoliters of your solution there. And then you let it dry, and you form these nice crystals, that, so your, your matrix and your analyte co-crystallizes together. And then you put it into the, uh, uh, into the mass spectrometer. The way we do this in our lab is here um, is actually a way um, where you can have liquid handling sampling robots that can actually do this automatically for you. So we use a mosquito mass uh, mosquito uh, robot for this, which puts about 16 spots in 30 seconds on there. So it takes us about a bit less than half an hour to spot a target automatically. So then once you have, have done this, you put your, your sample into the mass spectrometer. And um, once it's in the mass spectrometer, you you're, you're actually put a laser shot onto this. So this is a nanosecond uh, short shot. And what then happens is your matrix takes up the laser light. And because the, la the, the matrix gets excited by the laser light, it transfers a proton in the gas phase onto your analyte. Your analyte is then being accelerated into the mass spectrometer by a very strong voltage that is applied between your, your, your uh, multi-plate and this grid that you see on, on the, on the left-hand side. And this leads then to an acceleration of these ions into the mass, mass spectrometer. So MALDI is usually used with a time-of-flight mass analyzer, and the time-of-flight mass analyzer is actually a very nice mass analyzer um, because it is very, very robust in, uh, for, for this, and it is very fast. Because what now happens is in this field-free time-of-flight analyzer region, all these ions have the same um, kinetic energy, um, but the smaller ones, because they are smaller, fly much faster than the bigger ones. And what we are just doing is we are measuring the time it takes for the ions to reach the detector, and by this we can now assign a very accurate mass to these ions. And the MALDI mass spectrometer is actually very good for this because we can have a very wide mass, mass range. Theoretically, we can go to up to 100,000, although in a, in a high throughput manner you probably wouldn't want to do that. And I think one of the reasons why things have become really powerful now is this development of this new mass spectrometer from Broca. So this Rapiflex mass spectrometer was in originally intended for MALDI imaging. I'm not sure if you're aware of MALDI imaging. MALDI imaging is a way where you take tissue slides and you raster with a laser over the whole tissue slide to measure various masses, for example, for a drug that you want to measure in a tissue. Now, for this, Broca developed a novel 10 kilohertz laser, which is about 10 times faster than previous instruments, and this made this instrument really, really fast. But it wasn't really something that, that was thought to be useful for, for any other things. And we then saw that we could possibly now use the speed of this instrument for drug discovery. The other thing that is really nice on this instrument, it has a very high signal-to-noise ratio, 
due to new digitizers. A few years ago, we compared the new Rapiflex to the Ultraflex, which is another mass spectrometer, the, the earlier generation mass spectrometer, and they are both very sensitive instruments. When we allow a look at ubiquitin, we're down to about one, two femtomol of um, of, of, until we can detect it. So it hasn't changed much in the sensitivity, but what has changed significantly is the signal to noise you can get from this. So when you, when you see on the left hand side, we see in this curve um, how the ultraflex signal to noise ratio was, which was a log two of about five. But then when we, when we use the, um, the rapiflex in the standard mode me method, we get about uh, six. But then we could actually realize when we actually push the layer, laser power and a few other uh, methods, we could actually massively increase the signal to noise ratio to almost 8.5. So we almost had about a 15, 16 fold uh, increase in this um, signal to noise ratio. So we, once we had done this in, on, on, on the Rapiflex, we now went back to our DAP assay and ran our DAP assay. And as I said, um, we had high sensitivity, as it about two femtomoles on target for this for our, um, for our ubiquitin. And we have a very nice linearity. So this is something we have seen on almost all our essays. We have about almost three orders of magnitude on, on our essays, which is, I think, more than enough than you need for any drug discovery essay. And it's really nicely linear, linear. We did this on three different days. What was also nice is that we could start realizing that, as I said, some of the dubs don't work in the ubiquitin rhodamine assay, as you see on the top. So, for example, Otolin and Oto one don't work at all. Amsh doesn't work really well. And in our dub assay, we could actually get them to work really nicely. And these are actually dubs that do need to see both ubiquitins, the, the, um, the, the first and the second ubiquitin, to make a cleavage. So in the paper, then, we, we screened 42 human dubs um, against uh, eight different chain linkages and five different concentrations. And this is, of course, something that is only possible when you, use, um, um, high, when you do some form of liquid handling. So this was several thousand reactions that we did here. And we can show that there was some group, the group one up on the top. These are highly specific dubs. We got some moderate specificity in the middle. And then we have the low linkage specificity for USBs, which are known to be dubs that are, don't show any specificity in vitro, but actually they have any end specificity because of the localization of where they are being in the sound. Now, we screened at the time, the first time, some inhibitors, and these were all academic inhibitors that had been published because there was really no, nothing else known in the, in the field. So we screened all of the inhibitors, and many of them were, to be honest, quite poor. Uh, some of the inhibitors turned out to be entirely unspecific, as the one you see on the right. And, um, and this was a, a bit um, uh, sobering for us. But we then teamed up with um, Sarah Berlich and her son Gray at uh, Dana Harper Center in Harvard. And it was very nice to work with them because they had some really nice inhibitors, including the one here in the middle, which is a USP1 inhibitor, which is highly specific for USP1, which they published published here in Nature Chemical Biology. And, and this was nice to see that there was slowly coming some academic inhibitors that were really specific. But what was even better was then to work with industry, because now industry has also moved into the ubiquitin space and targets these with specific inhibitors. And one of them is actually USP7, which is a dub which is highly interesting for, for quite a few people, because the reason is USP7 regulates the stability of MDM2. MDM2 is a E3 ligase, which on the other hand regulates the stability of P53, which is the key tumor uh, suppressor in cells. So the idea is if you would inhibit USB7, you would stabilize the degradation of MDM2, and thereby you would stabilize actually P53. So this was a nice collaboration with Chen and Tech, and um, they came to us and gave us four inhibitors, I'll show you three, um, completely blindly. And what was really nice to see is that they were at 10 micromole on the left side. You see this highly specific for USB-7. On the right hand, even at 100 micromole, the middle one was highly specific for USB-7, showing you these are really excellent inhibitors. And at the bottom, you see an inhibitor that is actually um, it's called, uh, didn't work at all. And this was, was good because it was a blinded uh, sample for us. They wanted to put us an inactive compound in there as well, and it worked well for us that we actually didn't see any activity. We could then show that this USB-7 inhibitor is um, inhibiting USB independent of what kind of chain linkages it sees. So we have about a two micromolar inhibition for this USB-7, and it do doesn't matter what kind of chains you give to USB-7. 
It was really nice to see that it's then Genentech could f go further and it showed that these compounds now stabilize ubiquitinated MDM2 and thereby um, um, stabilize also P53. And this then ki kills the cancer cells, as you can see on the right hand side. So this paper has just been uh, published in Nature if you want to have a read through. It's very nice. And what is also very nice to see is actually there at the same in the same week, there were three other papers coming out with other USB-7 inhibitors. So this really shows there's a lot of interest now in the dub space for inhibitors. What is nice for us to see is that this technology that we developed uh, three years ago is now becoming really uh, more and more interest. So we have used this technology now in, 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 in academic space um, with, for another a few other things. For example, we identified that the UCHLs is another class of, of dubs. Actually, um, they, were, they didn't work initially in the dub screen. The reason is because they cleave off the final ubiquitin as a substrate. Uh, but what is very nice, we can actually still use the dub as a, as, um, for this because what we just have to do is we have to have a substrate that is monoubiquitinated and then um, the UCHLs work in our assay as well. We can still use them, uh, the, our assay, by measuring the formation of monoubiquitin. We have also shown that ubiquitin, uh, the phosphorylation of ubiquitin affects the activity of dubs using this multi-dub assay. And we have then, um, just in the last few months really, three papers came out with specific inhibitors for USB2, USB10, and the one I just presented, USB7. So this really shows that these inhibitors become more and more uh, interesting, and there's, there's something really happening in this space. Now, to conclude the multi top, top dub assays part, um, so we established and applied the multi-tough dub assay to quantify activity and specificity for dubs at different concentrations. This assay allows us to screen in a high-throughput fashion dubs against a physiological substrate in a label-free manner. And screening of dubs that was previously thought not to be possible is now possible. We have performed now um, in, in Dundee, where well, I was still in Dundee, we have screened, done, screened uh, dubs now against 10,000 of compounds, and this is now possible to do really target them with proper libraries. And what we have also now seen is that there's highly specific dub inhibitors that are in the nanomolar range um, that are now possible. So now I would like to switch gears and move to our E3 ligase assay. And as I said before, E3 ligases are also very attractive drug targets, but so far there hasn't been done much in this space. And one reason for that is it has been actually quite difficult to do proper high throughput assays. So we came up with the idea to use our idea of the multi dub assay and actually apply this to E3 and E2 and E3 ligases as well. So what we do is in, in vitro, we have an E1 and an E2 and an E3 together in a, in a, in a, in a a while, and then we add monoubiquitin and we add ATP, and after um, a while of reaction at 37 degrees, what actually happens is the E2 actually auto-ubiquitinates the E3 ligase. You don't, if you put in in a substrate, um, it does speed it up slightly, but you don't normally have to put in a substrate because this is already showing you the activity of E2, E3 ligase. And we can now add our N15 labeled ubiquitin again. And we can, what we now measure, um, unlike with the DAP assay, we're now measuring actually the disappearance of the light ubiquitin. And this is what you see here, that with time, the, um, the mono ubiquitin is disappearing. And if you titrate this nicely, you're well in the linear space that you can actually now measure, measure that. So this is how it looks like in reality. So in, in the top side, we have actually more monoubiquitin than our internal standard, and then it slowly goes down, and this is then um, something that you can measure in our assay. So we, we use this assay now to target um, three different um, E3 ligases, and they, of course, need to be clinically relevant. So the first one is MDM2, which I have shown you before. It's a very important negative regulator of the P53 tumor suppressor. The other one, which is, I think is a very exciting drug target, is HUIP, which is part of the linear ubiquitination assembly complex Lubac, which plays a major role in inflammatory processes as well as in cancer. So HUIP is the only enzyme that does these linear, linear ubiquitin chains, and these linear ubiquitin chains are essential for inflammatory processes. And therefore, um, we think this is a very exciting drug target. And the third E3 ligase was an itch, three E3 ligase, um, which is associated with ubiquitination in Th2 responses and therefore also interesting um, for uh, innate immunity. 
uh, in, in adaptive immunity. And what is really interesting, all these three E3 ligases are actually representing all, all three classes of E3, all three families of E3 ligases that are there. So, <clears throat> as I said, told you before, um, there is 35 E2 ligases and 600 E3 ligases. And one thing you always need to know before you actually do any screen is you need to identify what is the E2 and the E3 that works together. It's not always that simple. It's not always one E2 that always works with one E3. There is some, some in, in cells, they often have different interaction partners, but you need to identify which ones are working. And this is something that we call an E2 scan. So the E2 scan, normal, normally the way it's done is that you do all this incubation, you take your E3 ligase, and you incubate it with you know, as many E2 as, E2s as you can recombinantly make. And then you run gels um, and see if you see some form of ubiquitation happening. But you can see again, this is um, obviously you know, Western blot based or SDS page based, and it's expensive, time consuming, and there's obviously only a limited number of reactions you can do. But using our um, high throughput multi E2 screen, we could actually now e very easily, um, in a very short time, screen 28 different E2 ligases that we have recombinantly against our enzymes at eight different uh, time points. And what you see, the target is the highest activity. We could now identify for each of the E3 ligases the E2s that work well with them. Once we have done that, we could then linearize these assays by, um, by titrating um, the, the concentration of uh, ubiquitin and the enzymes. And what you see here is that these assays are really nicely linear, and um, you have then to optimize, of course, the right time point for each of them. But this is what we did for MDM2, HOIP, and H. So once we had optimized this, we used a few inhibitors that were published in academia, um, and again, Similar to the DAPs, we found that most of these inhibitors were actually not really good, were not very specific either, because some of them inhibited um, everything or some of them inhibited nothing. So it wasn't, wasn't really that great. Um, we were surprised that Nutlin seemed to uh, affect also itch, for example, which it shouldn't, because it should be actually um, something that only uh, inhibits MDM2P53 inhib um, interactions. What was also interesting is that PR619, which was actually a DAP inhibitor uh, that we put in our screen here as well, actually inhibited our E3 ligases as well. So this indicates that this, this is really a very unspecific compound that seems to inhibit everything with an active cysteine, really. But still, we could use our inhibitors screen to, uh, to make IC50s. And you can see here this glyotoxin, for example, inhibits HOIP at 7 micromolar, or this Bay compound, actually HOIP at 3 micromolar. But we wanted to show proof of concept that we can do screening with this. So we worked together with the drug discovery unit at Dundee University here in the UK. And we, they gave us 1,760 compounds. So these were all FDA-approved um, drugs. Um, that are available, and um, we screen them against all, each of the three ligases. So when we did these screens, um, we, we, we looked, of course, first for statistical significance. So this is something you do in drug discovery. This is called the set prime score, which gives you an idea of how good your screen is, how good your positive hits separate from your negative hits. And, um, and, and anything above 0.5 is actually a good screen. And you can really see that for, we had five different plates that we were running for each of the screen um, that we had uh, really nice set prime scores for this. So this means the assay worked really nicely. And as you can see here, when we look at these, um, the inhibition of these uh, compounds, we can see that MDM2, there was only one compound that slightly inhibits MDM2. There was in itch, we had actually two compounds that inhibited itch, and we had HOIP, that was about a handful of um, compounds that inhibited HOIP. And the one that inhibited HOIP by far most was a compound called bendamustin. And bendamustin is actually a nitrogen master. So I'm not claiming now this is a specific inhibitor for HOIP, because it isn't, because it's obviously alkylating a lot of things. But what was really interesting is that this compound does actually make a difference between these three, three ligases by a factor of at least 10 to 15-fold. 
right? So the, the, M, the, the IC50s between these three C ligases is, is quite substantially different. And I think this means that we can actually get some specificity for um, E3 ligase inhibitors. And this gives us hope that we can generate these inhibitors by doing high throughput screen. So to conclude this part, we have done the first label free high throughput E2 E3 ligase assay and established it to identify E2 and E3 pairs. This assay allows us to screen in a high throughput fashion E2 E3 ligases using physiological substrates in a, high, in a label free manner. And we performed the first high throughput E2 E3 label free, label free screen with about 1500 compounds. So now I come to the last part of our talk, and this is a paper that we just recently published um, where we wanted to show that we can actually move also into other enzymatic spaces. And because we are, we are very used um, to work with kinases, um, we, we looked, and can we actually compare our multi-screen of kinases with the biochemical acid that people usually use? And we used this to identify inhibitors of inflammation. Now, many of you probably know autoimmune disease is a very debilitating disease, and which includes diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. And this affects actually a very large number of the population. About 5% of the population is affected. And currently, the only good treatment that you have there is actually using very expensive anti-TNF antibodies. So there's a, there's a big interest in pharma industry to actually come up with small molecule inhibitors um, because they would make this treatment much cheaper. So in one, one of the compounds, uh, one of the areas we're looking at is this, uh, is, is this pathway downstream of tor like receptors. So I think many of you might have heard this. So there is in, in innate immune cells, but also in many other cells in your body, you have specialized receptors on your cell surface. They're called tor like receptors. They are very good. They, they, are, they have evolved to identify um, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So these are um, molecules on the surface of bacteria and other pathogens that then trigger a very strong innate immune response from your cell. And this includes um, actually activation of MAP kinase MS, MSK1. So while you have a very inflammatory, st strong inflammatory response, what is also happening is that these kinases activate a molecule called GRAB by phosphorylation, which then moves into the, uh, into the nucleus. And in the nucleus, this then activates the secretion of IL-10, which is um, a cytokine which counteracts um, the this inflammatory response. And the reason for this is because otherwise your inflammatory response would go completely haywire. So this is a kind of a safeguard that when your inflammatory response goes up, that you actually also put something there that dampens the inflammatory response also a little bit down. And what is really interesting is that the normal way it then works then is grab when it, after some time, because you don't want obviously only IL-10 to produce because then you have no inflammatory response, you actually, it gets phosphorylated by SIG-1, 2, 3 kinases again, and then it leaves the nucleus so, so you don't have this IL-10 signal anymore. But if you now inhibit this, these SIG kinases, the idea is that this then would lead to a much stronger IL-10 signal, which would mean that you have actually a much stronger anti-inflammatory response from your own macrophages, which would then help fighting infl inflammation. And this has been shown by, by, by several groups, including Philip Cohn's group from Dundee University, where you could show here on the left, you can see that IL-10 goes up in, when you treat with a very specific um, SIG inhibitor, um, but uh, it, it, it doesn't change at all um, when you have actually already SIG kinase dead knock-in in mice. And on the, on, on the B panel, you can actually see that this leads then to a reduction of TNF-alpha, and therefore you have a much reduced inflammation. So this is very positive. So we, we come up, came up with this uh, Malditov sig assay in a way that we want to have uh, the sig kinase. We put in a peptide that we know it gets phosphorylated really well by sig, and then by usage of, T, uh, of uh, ATP, we see an increase of the phosphorylated peptide. And what we're reading out in the mass spec is just the window of the peptide um, of the peptide substrate as well as the peptide product. So very similar to our DAP screen, really. But now we're looking at a single peptide. And these peptides, they fly really well. They ionize really well. This makes it really easier to do a high-foot screen for that. 
And we compared our maldito of acid that we see at the bottom, where we used um, our, our this, this, this peptide, and we're actually measuring the right, the real product, and we put this on a multi-target and analyzed by mass spec. We compare this to something called the ADP Hunter assay, which is, works in the way that we have in the kinase reaction, we obviously produce ADP um, out from ATP, and we are actually measuring in a second reaction the, a, the amount of ADP that is formed. So in this assay, you're actually not measuring the real product, but you're actually measuring the side product of the reaction. But this is something that is quite common. It's a fluorescent assay, and, um, and then you compare. So we wanted to compare how these two assays compare to each other. So the MALDI assay is very linear. Again, as I said, you know, our assays, are, we, we always find the assays are very linear um, and very reproducible. The sensitivity for this assay is very good for the phosphopeptide. We are, we, are, we, are, we are clearly below one femtomone of sensitivity. And we used five inhibitors on the right-hand side, including sarsborin, which all inhibit this sick uh, kinase um, at a really good levels, um, some of them even below a nanomolar. So in this high throughput screen, we screened uh, 3,000 um, ATP competitor compounds, which are in the kinase screen panel of the drug discovery unit in Dundee. And as you can see, we got a very nice normal distribution, and then we had quite a number of hits, actually, that inhibited um, um, more than two times of the standard deviation of the assay. And when we compare now the biochemical assay, which is on the uh, y-axis to the Malditov assay um, on the x-axis, we can actually see there is a very nice uh, linear distribution for the, for the positive hits. What is interesting is that only one or two the hits that are in the biochemical assay that we did not get in the Malditov assay, but we had quite a number of hits that we got in the Malditov assay, but we didn't get in the biochemical assay. And what was also quite interesting was actually this area at the bottom here. And these are actually compounds that seem to activate our, um, my, our kinases rather than inhibit them. And it's, it's been something that has been quite difficult in the past to find. For, in some, some cases, you want to actually find kinase activators, but most biochemical assays are almost, it's almost impossible to look for, by, for activators. And this multi assay, we found some of these, these activators, and we looked at them. You see here in the spectra, so at the bottom is the one how it normally looks like. You see on the left the substrate, on the right you see the product, and you see that the ratio is obviously much higher shifted on the, on the top compounds. And we could further validate these compounds. Uh, some of them really like this one. And the second one here, you see uh, about a 40 50% activation, while our inhibitors on the right hand side really show out to be inhibitors. And what I think is really nice now, that now that we have shown this um, in, for, for DAPs and E3 ligases and kinases, that this assay becomes more and more powerful because we're now moving into more enzymatic spaces. So we have in our lab now done DAPs, E2, E3 ligases, kinase, protein phosphatases, which I couldn't show you today, as well as actually histone arginine methyl transferases. And this is something, um, this histone arginine, arginine methyl transferases, so far there was no fluorescence uh, assay really available for. For protein phosphatases, what is, I think, very powerful for us is we can use this assay because many of the compounds that inhibit phos protein phosphatases are actually fluorescent compounds, and therefore it's much better to use them in a label-free uh, mildly assay. Other labs have also shown that you can use this in histone methyl, uh, lysine methyl transferases. Uh, TSK has shown acetyl choline esterases and histone demethylases, and we are now interested to move high throughput mildly tough mass spectrometry into other enzymatic spaces. So if you have a, a favorite enzyme and you always wanted to find inhibitors for it, but you can't use uh, fluorescent assays for various reasons and you want to do it label-free, it might be worth dropping me an email. Maybe there is something we can help you with. So to conclude, for us as an academic lab, it was quite straightforward to miniaturize and adapt these biochemical assays. Of, it could be e dubs or e 2 e or kinases, and then use high throughput multi mass spectrometry to do high throughput screening. The, we think the new instrumentation that has been developed in recent years with the increased speed and, and signal to noise, and there's actually now low cost multi targets available from Proca, where the target only costs about 10, 10 euros. They will allow very high throughput label free screening using multi mass spectrometry. 
And all together, we believe that high throughput multi-tof mass spectrometry is a great tool for label-free um, assays using unmodified physiological enzyme substrates. So I'd like to uh, come to the end here, and I'd like to acknowledge the people who actually did the work. So, so in my lab, Rachel Heap or, and, and, and people that have already moved on, which are Stella Ritorto and Virginia De Cesar, who actually did all this work. And um, I also like our collaborators at Harvard in Dundee, particularly the people in the MRCPPU in Dundee, our industry collaborators at Genentech and GSK, as well as Katrin Rittinger from the Crick Institute, and our um, friends at Broker, Daltonics, Michael Hammerstein. And I also like the funders, and I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Matthias, for that interesting webinar. Let's move on to the last part of today's webinar, the question and answer session. The first question is, do you think that high throughput multi-TOF assays can work for any enzyme in drug discovery? Um, yes, this is an interesting question. Yes, I actually think it can pretty much um, work in almost any enzyme that m must, does a mass shift, right? So, so, so um, and most enzymes do it. So if you have an isomerase, no, it's not going to work. But it has to have a mass shift. If your substrate is something that is really, really, really big, let's say you want to look at the phosphorylation of a protein at 100,000 Dalton, no, it's not going to work. I, mean, I don't think this is going to work because you need to be able to resolve it. But if, you're, if you can use um, substrates that are in the smaller range, I would think maybe up to uh, 20, 25,000, then I do think you can do this. And in many cases, if you have, if you have peptides or small molecules, if you have uh, metabolic substrates, I do think this is something that is going to work quite well, actually. Thank you very much. The next question is, which buffer components affect moldy TOF analysis? So this is this is a constant um, <laughs> discussion we have. So so most of the the biochemists we speak to, they're using buffer buffers that are you know have been used since the 50s. Um, and in many cases, there's buffer components in there that will affect multi mass spectrometry. So of, of course, you know one one problem is always very high high salt concentrations. If you have um, a very high salt concentration, the sodium will become a problem. But actually, we have tested many of these assays in high salt and low salt, and we never saw really any, any difference much in the kinetics. So I don't think this is absolutely necessary in all assays to have high salt concentrations. In some cases, it's also, for example, we had a collaborator who insisted on using um, large amounts of EDTA to stop the reaction and EDTA is the killer in the mass spectrometer, so, so it's not going to work. But actually, you know, we stopped the reaction with TFA, and it worked as well. So I do think, you know, you might have to adapt your, your, your standard assay protocol slightly, but I, I, in, in, so far we haven't seen uh, an assay which didn't work uh, for MALDI when you, when you had to, to look at this. One thing that probably will not work is actually the point that you um, that that something like a detergent will be quite problematic. But again, I'm not aware of many enzymatic in vitro assays that use very high levels of uh, detergent. Thank you. The next question is: Do you find any differential ionization efficiency between the substrate and the phospho product? Yes, we do. Um, so, so this is something that is uh, well known in MALDI, that there is a difference between uh, substrate and phosphopeptides in, in ionization. But in this case, actually, it didn't make much of a difference because, I mean, we, if you wanted to do absolute numbers, then you would need to have your, um, la you would have to have uh, isotopically labeled substrate and product in there. But in, because you're actually, in this case, only measuring um, the, the amount of how much you can phosphorylate um, compared to your substrate, it didn't really make so, so much a difference in our hands. It's actually something for me as a, as, a, as, a, as a scientist, it was something that I really needed to learn that in a, um, a high throughput screening is actually in many cases you only want to have a black and white decision. Is this now changing or is it not changing? So in the end, it didn't really matter so much that the, uh, for, that the ionization efficiency was slightly less for the phosphopeptide because we still got our ratios out of this and could actually measure this quite nicely. Thank you very much, Matthias. 
the next question is, is it possible to determine enzymatic kinetic parameters, such as inhibition constants or michaelis menten constants, by Moldy-Toff procedures? Um, yes. So, so we have we have we have done um, all of these. We have we have done KMs, KCAT um, in the paper. So, if you if you want to read them up, our recent papers, we have done them for, for using Maldi-Toff mass spectrometry. In some cases, it becomes when you go to really really high concentrations of substrates, it becomes a bit problematic. But um, we we have in in all cases been able to do it. Um, what is really good, actually, in most of the cases, we could reduce the amount of enzyme used substantially, which made the whole thing actually much, much easier. So you didn't need to, um, to uh, we didn't need to have really, um, you know, that that high concentrations of the substrate in the product. Thank you very much. My next question is: Can you measure protein small molecule binding? Oof. Um, this is, of course, then another essay, right? So, I mean, in, in, in principle, it is something where you, when you have a covalent interaction, then, yes, you will be, will be able to see this in MALDI. But normally this is something I, I think most people would probably, I don't know, wouldn't, wouldn't want to, 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 to look at. Uh, MALDI itself won't work if you want to look at an inhibitor on a protein um, because the interaction will probably not be stable enough to see this in a mass spectrometer. The other thing is that if your enzyme is 50 kilodalton and you want to put a 300 dalton um, compound onto this, the, the chances of, you know, the, you, have, you will have to have good resolution and, and so on. I don't think this is necessarily something that would work. I think it's much easier actually to look at um, the product and the substrate because they are also in much higher concentrations available in your essay. Thank you very much. The next question is, will this method work on other multi-top instruments or only on this top-of-the-line Bruca instrument? Um, yes, of course. I'm, in principle, you can, you can do these essays with all, in, with all MALDIs. I, I think that that is definitely something you can do. I mean, you know, the first, first stuff we, we, we used was the Ultraflex, which is obviously the, late, the, the earlier generation instruments. Um, the reason why we think for real high throughput screening, you probably will have to go um, in the end with, with, with the Rapidex because I don't think there is any instrument which is only is nearly as fast as it. I mean, the 10 kilohertz laser, just to give you an idea, I mean, we can now measure uh, 1536 plates um, of, of samples in less than 10 minutes. So um, the, our colleagues from GSK, um, they have even done, um, they, they went even further and they spotted 6,144, so four times as many spots, onto a 1536 sample uh, target. And so there are 6,000 sam samples on, on, on one target, and they ran this target in, in less than six minutes. So, so there are ways that you can really massively speed up this, the, 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 this essay, and I think this is something you can only do with this kind of instrument. But if you are looking for smaller sample numbers, yes, I think you, you probably will be able to use other multi tough instruments as well. Um, I, I think um, you will not have the benefit of this really nice um, digitizer, uh, as well as I said, the speed. I think the speed and the digitizer are really unique to this kind of instrument. Thank you very much. The next question is, what are challenges you face in selecting a matrix for different mo mo moieties from small molecule to larger peptides to ubiquitin? Um, just a second. Um, so, so the matrix we we never had. I mean, there isn't that many matrices really around. Um, so now I'm, I'm sure. Now, now I have to. What don't you? Okay, so so matrices matrices usually come somewhere in the area of 400 to 800. And the funny thing is, I mean, when I started using Maldi many many years ago, 
it was always said this is an area where you just can't see anything. But the funny thing is you can actually, you know, I mean, there are matrix ions, but actually in many cases you can still see uh, significant ions if you have, you know, your product and substrate which are in pretty high concentration, at least for Maldi, um, that they are usually quite in pretty high concentration, really, because it's such a sensitive technology. So we haven't seen much interference from any matrices, we must say. I, I hope I understand the, the question here right. Um, because, the, of course, if your matrix is now exactly at the same mass as the, as the, uh, the, the product or, or, or substrate, then you might get a bit into problem. But, I mean, again, the, the, the newer Maldives, they are also have such a high resolution that we actually are able to, to distinguish many of these ions quite significantly. Thank you very much. The final question today is, what is the maximum mass of a substrate product that can be reliably measured? Yeah, so, so the, the, I mean, we, we have been going to something like 15,000 now. Um, I, I think 25 maybe, this is, this is a guess. I guess, you know, you could possibly, um, at, you know, push it a little bit like that. But the problem in, in, in Maldi generally is that, um, you know, ionization is a, is a very competitive process, and the bigger the, the molecule, the more hard it will be to get, get it ionized. This is, this is quite clear. So I would think, you know, 25 is for me reasonable. I think you could push it maybe even a bit further than that. But I, I, for having a really reliable high throughput assay, you would probably want to stay below that. Um, but I think, you know, for anything below that, it works really beautifully. I mean, I, I'm amazed that we got this working really with a, a, a protein. I mean, it's a small protein, ubiquitin, but this was the first one we tried it, and it worked beautifully. I mean, the sensitivity and everything we got out of this was really nice. And um, I think for most people who want to work with peptides and smaller um, molecules, uh, this is something that will work uh, absolutely. I mean, I've seen now people work on lipids. Um, it, it, it sh all these, these molecules should work really beautifully. Thank you very much, Matthias. That is all we have time for today. Thank you very much for your informative discussion and presentation. Thank you to everyone for joining us online and for your interesting questions. I hope that you've found it to be a worthwhile session. If we didn't manage to answer your questions, we will follow up with you personally. And if you have any more questions, please feel free to email them to me at editor at selectscience.net. If you would like to listen to today's webinar or invite a friend to listen, it will be available on our website shortly. Goodbye and thank you once again. Thank you and goodbye from me too.